is it full time? We're going? So green means oh. go. <laughs> okay, we thought red, oh, red means go. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four. Good morning. What's a good um, Roots and Branches worship without a little awkwardness? <laughs> We're so glad that you're joining us today. If you're here live, thank you for being here. And if you're joining us online, you are just as much a part of our community. that about Tom. Spirit moves Tom on the bass and harmonies. He definitely connects with the harmonies. Oh, well, we're so glad that you're joining us today again. And um, thank you for joining with our hearts in worship and in spirit today. Um, I think 
Grace was the theme of the first song, and love is the theme of the second song. And um, <laughs> two great things about God, right? He offers more than enough grace, more than enough love. Feel free to sing along. saying a bunch of scripture over us, right? And the truth that God's love never ends. Love never fails. Um, amen. All right. Well, children, uh, you may head to the back and meet Miss Krista if you want to go to Children's Church next door. You are dismissed. <laughs> and then the rest of you can have a seat. Thank you so much. Good morning. Am I good? Okay. I think you're good. Yep. Okay, thanks. <laughs> good morning, Roots and Branches. My name is Kim. Hello. Welcome. My name is Kim Lynch. For those I haven't met, I've been part of Roots and Branches since um, really some of its earliest days, and I really couldn't be happier about that commitment. Um, whether you are joining us here in person, yay, um, 
or joining us remotely by Facebook Live. You are welcome and you belong. We are small in number but large in love for you and for our community. I have just a few reminders for this week. The first, Bible study. Mocha on the Mount continues this Tuesday, 7.30. We hope you return if you've been attending or join for the first time. Come on in. The second is about hope for youth. They're in need of donations, especially as weather gets colder. Some of those top needs include bottled water, canned chili, uh, mac and cheese cups, of course cash, and they have drop off donations on Wednesdays and Saturday mornings um, in Anoka. So check out the Roots and Branches or Hope for Youth Facebook page for additional details if you feel so called to help out with that. Lastly, save the date. Waddle off your gobble, Sunday, November 28th. Yes, I said that, wobble off your gobble. And it's a, a fundraiser for Stepping Stones at 1 p.m. It's a fundraiser walk, so stay tuned for more information about that. So most of you know that giving to Roots and Branches is also giving to our community, your community, your neighbors, your friends. I'm so proud that we aspire to half of all that comes in to go right back out as God's love in action. If your heart is called to give, you are invited to make an online donation at rootsandbranchesmin.org. If you're here in person, you can drop off a donation at the giving station and uh, see what happens when you do, because we're doing great things. For the last two weekends, I've had the good fortune to camp, cabin, hike in the North Woods, literally among roots and branches. Well, also, um, one trip included a 911 call to the fire department, but that's like a really different story, so I won't go into that here. Yeah. So both the roots and branches of the woods and the roots and branches that's our church invite me in without judgment, make me feel like I belong just as I am. I hope that I also extend that kind of hospitality to each of you, particularly if you're new and feel uncertain. If this is your first time at Roots and Branches, come say hi after church, even if we've already met, let's catch up because the people of this community are its roots and its branches. As Pastor Cullen said um, last week, we have big dreams of changing community for the better. You are always welcome here. And I am having problems with my microphone. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you to all of you who are here in person or online. I gotta just do a little, need a little space. Need, need, need room to work. All right. So, um, and here we go. We got it. All right. We are nothing if not professional around here. Insert laughter. Right. Exactly. Um, I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm so. Uh, it's such a. It is one of the profound privileges of my life to be part of this community. So thank you for being here today. Um, I, this is today. We're doing the third and final part of a series called "Better Than Advertised: Hope That Goes Above and Beyond." And we've been talking about how our world is full of advertising, and and every ad is a kind of promise. Uh, by this. Uh, you'll like it. Buy this, you'll be happier um, or thinner or better than your neighbor. And usually, uh, ads don't live up to those promises. And there's another kind of advertising, too, uh, the kind that emerges out of our culture and our religions, another set of promises that if you just believe all these things, uh, if you just follow all these rules, then you'll be happier and you'll be blessed. But the thing is, those kinds of promises usually fall flat too. And the reason those promises fall, fail to satisfy is that they aren't actually big enough promises. The promise of God's love is actually so much bigger than the way we usually try to contain it in our religious systems. And they don't capture the real promise that Jesus taught and lived and died for. So next Sunday... Um, as you probably know, it's Halloween, 
And though the religious significance of All Hallows' Eve shouldn't be dismissed, um, an equally significant reason to celebrate October 31st is that it's also Reformation Sunday. Uh, that's the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg and started the Pro Protestant Reformation. And if that whole sentence sounded like gobbledygook, <laughs> right? I know, I know that uh, for a significant portion it would. Um, don't worry, because I will explain what all of that is next week. Um, and, but the point of that story uh, is this. The church throughout history is always at its best when it is reforming, when it's discovering the ways it can do better and be better. Next week, we'll, so we're, next week we're starting a new series called Always Reforming, where we'll look at the different reformations and revolutions that have happened uh, in the history of Christianity, and I'll share what those movements meant back then and what they can continue to teach us today. Um, there's a particular way of understanding the world. Lots of people need a sense of history to ground them, to understand the present. If you're that kind of person, you're going to love this one. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, but, uh, so I hope you join us next week as we start that exciting new series. But today, we wrap up the series, Better Than Advertised, with a story about healing. Um, it seems a little strange to talk about healing after the year and a half we've had. Uh, and we read a story in the Bible today where Jesus saunters up to some stranger and just fixes what's wrong with his body. And, w and I can't help but think, you know, maybe... 2020 would have been a better year for God to become flesh and dwelt among us. Like, uh, we really could have used a little of that healing power the last year before a virus turned our world upside down. Of course, uh, there were televangelists who tried to pray COVID away. Um, but they just got turned into memes for the most part. Um, and there were, are still people who are rejecting vaccines because they trust Jesus with their health. Um, of course, those people only seem to trust Jesus with their health when it comes to this vaccine. They don't trust Jesus to be their seatbelt in the car uh, to, or to be their aspirin when they have a headache. So I think maybe it's not so much about all of that. When we, when we look at some of the stories of Jesus' healing power, we'll see that there were always naysayers and cynics, even when the truth was staring them right in the face. So here's the story for today. Uh, we've been walking through the first part of the book of Mark as Jesus establishes his ministry. And the story starts right at the beginning of Mark chapter 3. Here's, here's what it says. Jesus returned to the synagogue. A man with a withered hand was there. Wanting to bring charges against Jesus, the Pharisees were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And he said to the man with the withered hand, step up where people can see you. And then he said to them, the Pharisees, he turns to them, he says, is it legal on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they said nothing. Looking around at them in anger, deeply grieved at their unyielding hearts, Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he did, and his hand was made healthy. At that, the Pharisees got together with the supporters of Herod to plan how to destroy Jesus. Okay, so a lot just happened. Um, I'll recap. So Jesus goes to the synagogue. That's the center of Jewish teaching in Jesus' day. It's a relatively new invention at the time. Uh, it's the center not just of learning, but also where the rabbis and Pharisees did their thing, uh, making and observing the rules that guided life for all uh, the Jewish people in Jesus' world. So when Jesus goes there, he knows he's going to have an audience of people who love the rules. Uh, I'll just add here that I talk a lot of smack about Pharisees, um, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Uh, the thing is, I think, uh, uh, I, I talk a lot of smack about Pharisees because the Bible talks a lot of smack about Pharisees. That's, that's the real reason why I do. Uh, also, there aren't any around today to get offended. Um, but we don't often look at things from their point of view. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of them truly, sincerely believed they were doing the right thing. Because they were born into a system where if you followed the rules, God's favor was on you, and if you didn't follow the rules or couldn't follow the rules, then God wasn't on your side. 
Uh, and so they gave everything they had to be on God's good side. And if that's what you're raised with, uh, when their rules-based existence, it makes a lot of sense. And when this troublemaking young rabbi, Jesus, shows up at your synagogue, you're not necessarily going to roll out the red carpet for him. So Jesus is in front of these Pharisees, and Jesus approaches a man he finds with a withered hand. And he knows, he knows that the Pharisees are just waiting for him to do the wrong thing, to say the wrong thing, so that then they can work against him. You might remember from a couple weeks ago, uh, before healing a man who was paralyzed, Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. And even that made the Pharisees who happened to be there clutch their pearls and gasp. Um, And if you missed that message, uh, it's on Facebook and YouTube. You can go check it out. It's also on our podcast, Roots and Branches, the podcast. Uh, And here, Jesus knows the Pharisees are listening more closely. And it happens to be the Sabbath, uh, the holy day of rest. And in Jesus' world, there were very specific guidelines around resting on the Sabbath. And one of the rules was that... um, Oh, that thing gets all stuck together real bad. All right. One of the rules was that you can't heal on the Sabbath because you're doing work. It's the work of a doctor. So before Jesus heals the guy, because he always knew he was going to heal the guy, uh, Jesus turns to the Pharisees and says, is it legal on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? And this is really great because Jesus knows that there are some Sabbath loopholes. Like if your ox falls into a pit, on the Sabbath, it's okay to break the Sabbath and do work and pull your ox out of the pit to save it. And Jesus sees this guy with a withered hand and says, isn't he worth so much more than an ox? That deformity almost certainly kept this man from any kind of meaningful uh, and profitable work since almost everything was manual labor. And it also excluded him from the temple where purity codes excluded him because of his disability. So when Jesus throws this question to the Pharisees, they don't answer. They sit there silently because they know the right answer, but they don't like the right answer. They don't want to say it and prove Jesus' point. And the next part of the story is a description of Jesus' inner world at this moment. Uh, It says he was looking around at them with anger, deeply grieved, at their unyielding hearts. This is the description of the good religious people in Jesus' world. These were the ones who knew they were right, who followed every rule, and yet, when the embodied love of God is standing there in front of them, in the flesh, they couldn't see it. And here's the thing, That's pretty much how religious people operate to this very day, if you've met many of them. The other day, I told someone I was a pastor, and I could see their body tense up um, after I said the words. Like, that's, that's someone who's either been hurt by a church or someone who's been told they aren't good enough to have a normal conversation with a religious leader. That's messed up, (laughs) but it's not unusual. Uh, Religion so often says that God is on the side of the people who follow the rules. But I need to tell you, the love of God is so much better than advertised. Churches have a reputation of being the place where you're guaranteed to find judgmentalism and shame. Um, In the name of our holy standards, we've dumped on people for centuries. But if you think about it for just a few minutes, it doesn't make any sense for churches to be that way. If we're really God's people, like if we have tapped in to the truth and power at the center of this world and we get what the Creator is up to on earth, shouldn't we be the safest place in the world? Shouldn't this be the place where you can be honest about your hurt? your abuse, your trauma, without getting judged or blamed for what happened to you? If we're really the beloved community of God, shouldn't we be advocating for those who are discriminated against in our world? Uh, Our 
BIPOC brothers and sisters and siblings, those with disabilities, refugees, and any other marginalized group. And not just like as a footnote, like we mostly go to church, but we do this too. Uh, but we, uh, you know, like we'll do a fundraiser here and there. Loving our left out neighbors should be central to who we are in living in such a way that they truly know we see them as neighbors and not just outside people we, and we want to feel good about ourselves. Um, if, if we really are going to live into our identity as the beloved of God, then shouldn't church be the safest place in the world for kids to come out as gay or trans or non-binary? Instead, most churches never see those kids again once they have a self-realization. Never hear their stories. Never embrace them when life is hard. Never do the thing that Jesus would definitely do if he were standing in front of them. And as Jesus stands in front of that man in a synagogue, he simply says, stretch out your hand. No magic words, no incantation, just stretch out your hand. And this man who's been limited his entire life by this disability is suddenly whole. Jesus doesn't ask for much. Just this simple, small act to show that this man's engagement and agency actually matter. Stretch out your hand to show that you want to be healed and you believe that this Jesus can make it happen. Uh, I'm going to do something a little different now, a little interactive. Uh, I have a question for you. Where do you see a need for healing in our world? Whether it's in your life or in our community or in the world at large, where do you see the need for healing? Uh, what's the issue? Whether it's an individual health concern like this man in our story or if it's like sickness in our society, where do you see a need for the healing love of Jesus. I want you to turn to the people near you and just for like 30 seconds and share the first need for healing thing that lands on your heart when you think about the need for healing in the world. Um, so maybe it's just one word, maybe it's something specific. Uh, if you don't wanna share, that's okay too. Just say pass and the people around you will respect that because we're nice like that. Um, <laughs> I want to take 30 seconds, okay, for you to quickly just pair off twos and threes and share the one thing on your heart where God's healing is needed. So I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite you to share with the group when you're done too, if you want to, but again, you don't have to, making it easy on you, okay? Are you ready? Do you understand the assignment? Ready, set, go. If you're viewing online right now, feel free to share in the comments uh, on the video you're watching. Share a place where you see a need for healing. Uh, we would love to hear from you. All right. What do you have? Who has something they'd like to share with the class? Where do you see a need for healing? Yeah, Zena. School, at your school, lots of it. Yes. The city of Minneapolis and the shootings going on right now, that's hard. Thank you, Angie. Yes, Courtney. Oh, it, is, it is hard. It is hard to live in a world that's so divided on those issues. Hmm. Yes. Just society, nation, all the divisiveness absolutely need healing in our hearts, in our souls, individually and then collectively, like healing broken systems in our society too. This is when we realize that the love of God is so much better than advertised. When we can share what's breaking our hearts, when we hold one another in trust and assurance, knowing that the God's healing strength is by our side, and that if we, and that Better yet, we get to be a part of the way God is doing a healing work in the world. All these things that we name today 
you can be part of the healing work that God is doing to make that whole. Um, I often close my time sharing with you with a blessing. A blessing is really just the expression of holy longing. It's a gift that says, whatever part of the divine lives in me, it reaches out toward you to give you what you need. So that's what a blessing is. And today, I'm going to offer a blessing again. But if you expressed a need for healing, uh, whether it was for yourself or for a situation or for a problem in our world, I want to offer you the same invitation that Jesus expressed to this man in our story. I want to invite you to stretch out your hand. And as you stretch out your hand, know that you are taking responsibility for your role in making this blessing come to pass. And at the same time, you can know with complete confidence that Jesus is also reaching out to you to pull you along, to offer you grace, and to help you be the healing force that your world needs. So I, I invite you to stretch out your hand. And so, may you be stirred deep in your heart by the same God who spoke the whole world into being, the God who made our bodies that can break and bleed, but also heal and bless May that God give you the vision to see the healing that has already begun. May God give you the strength to take hold of the hand that will lead you on. And may you see with your own eyes the ways that God is at work to heal our broken lives and this broken world. May you be filled with love for this world and the people in it, scars and all. And be part of the healing as God works within you to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God. Amen. Uh, will you pray with me as the band comes up for one last song today? God, we thank you that your love holds us close. We thank you that you are up to something in this little church and in this world, even so, though sometimes it's hard to see, hard to name. Uh, your, your mysterious bigness is just beyond our words and what they can contain. But, but here we are, trying. So we ask that you would work within us, help us to offer honor and love and hope to the people around us. May others find in us a safe person to be them, their full selves so that we can then in turn offer this love to the world. Amen. 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 All right. Come on up. Come on up, band. Band peeps. Um, I do have to share with you something that happened last night. Um, I just popped awake. I have been reading this book, too, so my mind was kind of heavy with things that I've been trying to digest a bit about God's love and inclusiveness and acceptance. And I, um, I woke up with this mind running, or this thought running through my mind was, um, we're all in, we are all in, there is no them, there's only us, like we've said. And then I thought how, so one of my ideas of um, the healing thing that we had talked about, Cal and I talked about was like religious trauma in the people that I've met that have been sort of burned and hurt by church all across the board, lots of different denominations and things. It isn't just like one specific, it's just, the religious rules and leaders and whatever. Um, and I thought in my mind, <laughs> as I'm awake at like, I don't even know what time it was. It, it, I was thinking, we have, what, what if we just all agreed that we're all in and we're all accepted and we're all loved because we've wasted so much energy and time trying to categorize who's in, who's out, who's going where, who's going to what place. What religious holy rules are you following and you're not following and I need to keep track of all this stuff. And I just realized at 3 a.m. or whatever it was, like, what could we actually do as the people of God if we didn't, weren't wasting so many, how many hundreds of years on the energy of that, deciding that? Like, we've totally missed the point. We have very much missed the point. And how much healing and love could we offer the world 
if we weren't so obsessed with that traditionally, not just the people in this room, just collectively as Christians and religious people. Um, so, everyone, <laughs> we're all in, and there's no more time to waste. There's no more time or energy to spend on that crap. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to say something else. I did not. <laughs> but that's what the 3 a.m. Jenny woke to this idea. You ca we cannot. We cannot waste any more time. There's just no more time to waste. And if we're all in, that settles it. Like, I just don't care anymore. So there's no them. It's all us. And so how can we offer the healing and the love to the, to the world that God is, keeps calling us to do, to, to live out? Um, we're going to sing about God's reckless love today before we head back out in your world, in your life. And, um, and I, think, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but when this song first came, became popular, of course, I was researching a bit, and a lot of churches were doing it, and they loved this song, and we love this song. And I realized there were some haters on this song. <laughs> of course, there's always got to be some haters. But <laughs> they were, like, talking about God's love is not reckless. It's very intentional. And they didn't like some of the, the language used in this song. And I kind of disagreed with that because the idea that God's love is reckless is, like, I, I envision it just being a blanket over the whole world. It is, it is not um, – it, it, it just scatters everywhere, like – they say in scripture, it says, you know, the sun and the rain falls on the wicked and the righteous alike. That is the mercy and the grace of God. It's offered freely to all. That is reckless. Just going and spreading all that love and who's going to take it and not. And what are you going to do with it? Are you going to abuse it? Or are you going to use it? Or are you going to transform? Or are you going to change? Or are you going to offer it to someone else? Or no. I mean, that's what's reckless about it. And so I view it as a mercy and a grace, this reckless love. It's, it's beautiful. So if you want to stand up and worship uh, and sing one more song with us, or you can stay seated however you want to worship is your, um, is your preference is just fine. We can sing about God's reckless love today. Before I spoke a word, you were singing. So good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so
So while you won't kick down and lie, you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, or mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No, there's no wall you won't kick down, or lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for offering whatever part of heart you, your heart you were able to share uh, today with, with, with the people around you, uh, to God. And wherever you're coming from today, know that the love of God is after you. It sees you exactly where you're at and accepts you for exactly who you are. That is the reckless good news of the love of God that invites us all to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Amen. Amen.